Paula Kerger, the president and CEO of PBS, has been on the job since 2006. She took over with a new vision and new initiatives, but some of the old challenges remain. Resources continue to be tight, and the competi competition continues to be fierce from both cable and the Internet. What does the future look like for PBS in terms of programs and funding, and for its future place in America's media landscape? For some answers, we're joined by Paula Kerger. Paula, welcome back to Chicago and Thank to you. Chicago Tonight. Thank you. It's great to be here. First of all, let's start with some political questions, and that mm -hmm. is, you know, as I was uh, getting ready to speak with you, I went online and looked at you know, recent PBS postings and articles about PBS, mm -hmm. and being in the middle of a presidential campaign, still some... Um, some views on, on the part of, from some quarters that PBS is too liberal. For example, they point out that uh, one argument is that the commentators on uh, the news hour appear to be anti-McCain or pro-Obama. Pro How do you respond to this continuing concern about so-called liberal bias? Well, I think that uh, we live in partisan times, for sure. And I think that occasionally people will look at any news operation and, and accuse bias. We look at what the public says about public television. And every year we participate in a Roper poll which shows public television as being the um, most fair and balanced of all of the journalistic operations. We take that seriously. I think the fact that both Jim Lehrer and Gwen Ifill were picked to do two of the four presidential debates signals something, eh, that the work that we do is of, of fine quality, that we do try to have multiple points of view represented, and that we do try to move beyond the soundbite journalism. This campaign has been fascinating to watch on so many levels, but the thing that I find frustrating is that we continue to talk about the issues um, around the side, and we talk about the things that are not as, as significant. And I think what we've tried to do on the news hour, on all of our news and public affairs programs, is to put things in context and to actually pull the issues out and not talk about uh, sound bites and the, and the trivial. You mentioned, you, allude to, uh, you alluded to Gwen Ifill, and mm -hmm. she was in the news as well. Did you personally know that she was working on this book that, uh, for which she's been criticized as, uh, uh, as not being particularly good timing in terms of her role as a moderator for the vice presidential debate? I actually debate. didn't know about the book, but I know she had talked publicly about it. And, uh, and I think that the result of her participation in the debate, which should really close the issue, because I think she was absolutely fair in the way that she conducted that debate, and I think both of the candidates would agree to that. So there was no need for her, in your opinion, to have recused herself from, that, uh, from being a moderator? I, I don't think so. I think there's no relation. Two historic issues that PBS uh, has been dealing with, uh, and that is programming and funding. And um, what should the programming, the PBS, what, what kind of programming should PBS be putting out, you know, given what's happening in cable and given what's happening on the Internet? We spend a fair amount of time looking at the rest of the broadcast industry because I think that part of what public television should be doing on an ongoing basis is to try to serve those that aren't being served by the rest of the media. And I think that from my perspective, perspective there are three key areas that I think really define public broadcasting and that are quite different than anyone else is doing. One is beginning with news and public affairs. We have a deep commitment to trying to bring the issues to the fore and we've consistently done that through this election period, but we'll be there after the election because I think after is uh, going to be a pivotal point for our country as we really try to grapple with so many profound and fundamental issues. The other area that is of great importance and interest to me is the work that we do for children. We spend a lot of time particularly focused on early childhood, but also for kids in school. And, you know, Sesame Street, I know this may... Um, really put the fear in some people when they realize that next year Sesame Street celebrates its 40th anniversary. <laughs> I remember when Sesame Street started. I just can't believe that 40 years later it is a strong and important part of what public television offers for children, but it's just one piece. We have lots of programs that are curriculum-based, and I think that's very different. And then the third area is the arts. I think something that you and I both share is an interest, in, and we value the arts. I think the arts defined a society, and uh, at broadcast television and cable for the most part, have um, have doubled in the space, but really can't figure out how to make it profitable, and so have left it besides. A&E no longer does much arts programming. Bravo has really defined itself around reality programs. And I think that it's tremendously important that people across this country have access to the arts. You're here in Chicago. You have 
some of the most extraordinary arts organizations here in this city, but everyone should have access to them. And I think there's a role for public television to play, and so we're looking to increase the amount of arts programming that we have in the schedule and in, in the years to come. Sometimes uh, PBS's arts programming uh, makes headlines or ruffles some feathers. For example, you have an upcoming production of King Lear, Ian McKellen. There's reports that there's full frontal nudity involved. Is, are those scenes going to be aired on PBS? We haven't seen the final edited version yet, so I can't tell you what we're going to air. It is an extraordinarily powerful production from the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, that was done uh, in just three cities across the country last year. It is an amazing repertory uh, performance of a series of actors, and Sir Ian in the title role is, is quite extraordinary. And it'll come to uh, the air in the spring of next year. In terms of language, every now and then there are issues involving PBS and the FCC and the kind of language that can be used. What's the latest? Is there like a rule that you have that viewers should be aware of? Well, there isn't a, uh, a, a bright line, so to speak. In fact, this issue actually is sitting right now with the Supreme Court, not with an issue connected specifically to public television, uh, but, in, uh, but two programs that broadcast out of commercial television that really challenge some of the FCC's recent um, rulings on what's referred to as fleeting expletives. Um, from our perspective, and I know it may sound awfully odd that the president of PBS is talking about uh, language, but I think that there are moments when language matters. We've done a whole series of documentaries, most recently out of Frontline, a documentary called Soldier's Heart, where um, footage was captured of soldiers in combat. I think in those cases, language does matter. I've seen the footage edited and unedited, and the, there is an impact difference. And I think that there are times for an adult audience, for sure, and with um, disclaimers ahead of time so that people know what they're going to watch, it does matter. Uh, how is PBS's financial health right now? There's always, there's always concern about that. Well, I think that uh, one of the legacies of public broadcasting is that we have never been overfunded, for sure. And uh, so Never been awash <laughs> with riches. Never been awash with <laughs> riches. But I think, in, in part, it's forced us to be a bit more creative. Uh, like every other nonprofit organization, we are obviously looking at the economy and, uh, and everything going on around us, and we are trying to work very hard and smart in the way that we use our resources. I think it's important for uh, viewers to know that WTTW exists because because of the support of the people in this community. I think sometimes people think that we are largely funded by the government nationally. About 15% of our funding comes from the government. The rest comes from viewers like you. <laughs> and so it is important that if you care about uh, programming like this one, if you care about the kind of work that happens on public television that, uh, of our origin. It sounds like a good uh, follow <laughs> Last question, the potential impact on PBS of a new administration. Well, um, we're looking at a new administration as well as a new Congress. And I think that uh, both candidates have uh, supported public broadcasting in different ways. I think uh, Senator Obama's interest is uh, very keen in terms of early childhood education, which is an area that we have spent a lot of time and effort uh, developing out. Uh, Senator McCain has um, moved forward efforts to reauthorize public broadcasting. So uh, I think w with both candidates, the difference will be how they deal with the overall economy and the budget. And we'll be looking forward to working with whoever is in the White House. Paula Kerger, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. Good to have you here.